Hello everyone, my name is Marcel and this week we're going to be studying the lesson number nine, the rhythms of rest. And this lesson is a beautiful lesson because it's about the Sabbath. And it's, it's not just for us to have this theoretical knowledge, but that we can have this day-to-day -day application of what this rest in Christ means. And we're going to dive into the Bible and see what these different rhythms of rest means from God's rest. An interesting thing about the Bible is that the Bible does not spend much time trying to prove God's existence. And it does not try to, to offer empirical proof of that, that creation happened. The Bible just assumes it. In the very first verse of the Bible, we have the phrase, in the beginning God created. And in just in that phrase, we have answers to the most foundational questions in life. For example, we find the question of when all this happened, when, or when all this creation happened. The Bible says in the beginning. Another one is who? It says God, not by chance, not by chaos. Another question is how? Well, the how is by creation is the method that is used by the maker, not evolution, not a big bang. God created from nothing. God pulled things into existence that were not there before. We as humans, we don't have that ability. We can't create from nothing. What we do is we, we transform what is already there. But when it comes to God, God has this power of creating things from nothing. He has that ability. And we can answer the question as well of what. What was created? The Bible says the heavens and the earth. This book, the Bible, is designed to provide the answers to, to the most basic questions. Origin, purpose, destination, where we came from, what are we doing here, where we are going. It's exactly the, the book that has been attacked uh, like its credibility. The thing is, friends, that without Genesis, without the first book of the Bible, the rest of the Bible makes absolutely no sense. And the Bible does not provide absolute revelation. The Bible provides necessary revelation that we need to be saved. So the Bible is not going to go into the deepest details of physics or chemistry. It assumes from the outset that God is the one who established those laws. So at the same time, the theory of evolution remains just that, a theory. Despite all its pretension, it's not science. What it is just scientific philosophy that demands a lot of faith. For example, a car has about 23 parts in pieces. Not even one person in this world would defend that the simplest model is a product of chance or an explosion. No one will defend that. Now imagine this world with its beauty, its complexity, its splendor, its purpose, its mysteries, its enigmas being attributed to blind luck, to random chance. That doesn't make sense. First, we, we're going to find that scriptures reveal truth, the truth, that this truth is inaccessible to human logic and reason and inaccessible to, hu to human methods of research. But this doesn't mean that God is illogical. Instead, means that God is super logical, that he is beyond our capacity of logic and reason. He is that big. And this is the thing, friends, that, that, that we have hard times, sometimes hard times, trying to understand how big God is and how small we are. We are very small. We are very small. And you know that despite of millennia of all sorts of of intensive and direct attacks of the Bible, the Bible continues to declare its foundational message that is, in the beginning, God created. And you might be thinking, what does this has to do with the lesson of this week? The rhythms of rest. Remember, the ob objective of the Sabbath school teacher is not to repeat what we already study in, in, in the lesson. It's to bring new information that is according to the same topic that we just covered in the lesson that we just studied this week. But going back to the topic, and, and you, you will see where I'm going with this, with this in the sense of the rhythms of creation, when we will find in the Bible 
where it says that in the beginning God created, we encounter these scenes of a beautiful paradise that now it has been lost because of sin. Scripture illuminated the path that this planet took and what was the cause of this detour. However, even though that is marred by, by, by sin, Psalms 19 gives us a marvelous description of this, of this planet. So if you have your Bibles out there with you, I, I will invite you to go to Psalms chapter 19. And we're going to read verses 1 to 4. Psalms chapter 19 verses 1 to 4. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They have no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's interesting that after all was created, all this beauty, all this splendor, all this magnificence, God revealed his work. And he says something very interesting. Go with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, to see what God says. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. It says, God saw that what he had made was very good. So after all that God has created, he turned his attention to, to something else. God simply made a day on the seventh day. But was it this day just like any other day? Of the previous six days? No. He made this day special, different, unique. He made it singular. God set a marker, marker as, a, as, a, as a living, memorable day. He wanted this day for us to stop and deliberately enjoy life. The real enjoyment. Sabbath was made for man and not the other way around. It's a day for us to be and not to do. You, did you catch the difference? It was a day for you to be, for you to exist before your Creator, not for you to do as a product of consumerism. It's a day to celebrate the gift of grass, wildlife, water, people, and most importantly, the existence of a Creator and all these gifts. And this invitation was going to continue even after the first couple was exiled from Eden. God wanted to make sure that this invitation could stand the test of time. So right from the beginning, he needed it into the very fabrics of time. We see the creation moves from space to time. What did, I have a question. What did God create first? Life or the environment for life? The environment, right? God created space and then life. Creation moves from space to life. What he created is seen initially as good. An expression that appears five times. And this expression appears five times in Genesis chapter 1. However, on the sixth day, after the creation of man, this expression changes and gives way to a more intense description. And involve the entire creation because here God says, and we just read this verse in Genesis 1.31, where it says that God saw that all that he had made was very good. In the same, in the same way that creation moves from space to life, time flows from ordinary time to a special time. You know that the Sabbath appear, appears connected with creation in three mainly texts. We're going, to find, we're going to find this reality of the Sabbath being like linked with creation. And these uh, three verses, there are more verses, but the main ones is Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11, and Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 to 17. These texts provide the origin of the Sabbath and the purpose of the divine commandment of its observance. Both of these, the origin of the Sabbath and the commandment of rest, are deeply rooted in the, con in the consequence of God's cre created activity. 
And there are four basic points of emphasis in these verses, or so four important lessons that I would like us to, to, to study today. Lesson number one is that on the, on, on the seventh day, God concluded his creative activity. The idea of, of the ver- verbal construct was not just the idea that God had done, that he took the work t- till the end. The verb here, it ex- expresses the idea of completion, of reaching a desired goal. And this goal was going to be the creation of humanity, to spend time with him. God did what he set out to do. It was not interrupted. It was not half done. It was not incomplete. God concluded what he set out to complete. And what's interesting is that this ordinary time finds its purpose in this special time. So the ordinary time, when I say ordinary time, I'm talking about the the first six days of creation. The ordinary time, the six days of our lives, find its meaning, find its purpose in the special time. When I say special time, I'm talking about the Sabbath. Was it not the same with God? God created during six days. But on the special day, everything that he made made sense. One flows into the other. And and you know what, what I mean by that? Like our lives, since God is our supreme example, if your ordinary time does not flow into the special time, there's something wrong with our ordinary time. Lesson number two. Lesson number two is like God rested on the seventh day. God's rest serves as an example for us. For humans that were created on the sixth day, on the Sabbath. For the humans, that was the first, the, the, they were created on the sixth day. But for humans, the Sabbath was the first day of their existence. They had not worked yet. They were not tired. They were not tired. Had they been worked during the whole week? No. No, right? So we don't, we don't rest because of the week that has passed. We rest for the week that is ahead of us. They rested because God rested. They rested to commune with their creator, to enjoy his creation. Before, you know, before humans ran, ran off to their schedule, they were called by God to establish their priorities. What was important in life? And we still need today that reminder to have our values, to have our priorities adjusted by God. And that is one of the purposes of the Sabbath, to establish our priorities. The third lesson that the text or these texts present is that God blessed the seventh day. Just as God blessed the animals and humans, and you can see that in verses 28 and 20, 22 and 28, the blessing of the Sabbath, like that word bless. To bless means that humans are imbued with this power of enrichment and of prosperity to find contentment in life, joy in life, peace in life. So in other words, the seventh day was a gift from God imbued with a blessing that no other day possess. And all this destroys the idea that it doesn't matter what day I keep, like I can keep whatever, doesn't matter. Like, we don't have that in the Bible. We don't have a text in the Bible that, that confirms that it doesn't matter the day of worship. God still accepts that. We cannot find that. And who am I as a human to remove that blessing on that special day and say, it's everywhere. It doesn't matter. I cannot do that. If I do that, I will be playing God and that will be blasphemy. The fourth lesson that we can learn from these texts is the holiness and sanctity of the Sabbath. The biblical text affirms that God made the Sabbath holy and that he sanctified it. But what does that mean? The basic idea of sanctification is setting apart, is setting this day apart. The Sabbath was separated by God to make a day of weekly rest. It was God who separated, not humans. It was God and no one else. The sanctification of the Sabbath is an act of God. The Sabbath is a holy time, not a holy place. It invites us to set aside a common day work to stop and devote that, devote our minds and our bodies to a holy to holy things. Invite the Sabbath invites us to stop our work of every day. 
that we do in every day and calls us to have communion with a creator. So while you might go to, to, to places or be excluded from places, you cannot be excluded from the Sabbath. Everyone has this day. Everyone has access to this special time. And in this way, the Sabbath is a temple in time. The weekly rest of the Sabbath brings us hope. It brings us certainty that our, of our origin. Our destinations are in God. It gives us a sense of continuity from past and hope from, for the future. It invites us to rest while we live in this chaotic and convoluted environment of this world. We live in this sort of detour, friends, generated by sin while we are waiting for our final rest. And we can find that in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Friends, this is the message of the Sabbath. Remind us weekly of our origins and our purpose and our final destination. We can see as well in the lesson that we have the story of manna. And we have the story with the, with the provision of manna and how the provision of manna is a very strong argument, in fact, for the reality of the Sabbath. But let me tell you this. The Sabbath was a greater gift than the manna. And you might say, how? Because they needed the manna to survive. They needed to live. They needed food. But the Sabbath is a greater gift because the Sabbath celebrates the provider of the manna. Would there be any manna without a provider? No. Here with the manna, the story of the, the story, the Israelites were stopped for the work of survival in recognition that God was the provider. We also have in the lesson like when, when Moses was about to die. And when the Israelites were about to enter into the promised land, he reminded them, Moses reminded them of some important ideals, of some important commands. And this is what the book of Deuteronomy is about, where the, commands, the commandments are repeated. We know that in Deuteronomy 5, the commandments are repeated. The interesting thing is that commandments can be summed up. Each one of the commandments can be summed up in one word because it's the reflection of, of God's character. So it is a reflection of his attributes. So for example, the first commandment can be summed up in the word fidelity. The second one can be summarized in the word worship. The third one, reverence. The fourth one, dependence. The fifth, honor. The sixth, respect of life. The seventh, purity. The eighth, the eighth honesty. The ninth, truthfulness. And the ten contentment. So when the sun sets on when the sun sets on Friday, I interrupt my ordinary activities. I close my business. I shut down the computer. I close the books, and in doing so, I am declaring that my life does not depend on my business, on my studies, on my work, on my bank account, or on a secular success or on anything that I can buy or consume. By resting in the presence of the Creator, I am essentially affirming that my life depends totally and absolutely on God. Resting from the anxieties and worries that usually crush and consume me, that raise the beat my, that, that my heart beat, that intensifies my blood pressure. Friends, Resting on the Sabbath is a sign of resting in Jesus. Because we can only truly rest when we feel safe enough to disconnect. And when I finish repeating that phrase, we can only truly rest when we feel safe enough to disconnect. May God bless you. And I hope that this lesson helps us to see the value of the Sabbath. May God bless you.